you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's uh, can we sing the that man from Galilee. Five twenty nine, five twenty one, five two one. Start with the chorus, please. Yeah. Okay, let's start with uh, four eighty one. Amen. Four eighty one. I love him. Key of C. Oh, I of F, I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to 
your sin. Ask him, oh God, don't let anything hinder you to come among us tonight. Save you. Save you. Be my humble cry. Oh, I approach you tonight we have come oh God in this Friday Lord Jesus just to to get in your presence tonight you said wherever two or two three are gathered together in your name you will be in the midst here we are in this building oh God more than two more than three we we just oh God bowing our head before you to invite you oh God by your grace by your grace to come tonight among us, Lord, and fill this place with your presence, Lord Jesus. We have a desire, a longing desire in our heart to get closer to you, O oh God, to be in your presence, Lord Jesus, to receive something from you. That's why we have come, Lord Jesus, tonight to be in your presence. O oh God, we have come to thank you for keeping us since Sunday that we left, O oh God, from this place. Your grace and mercy, O oh God, is bringing us again in this place, Lord Jesus. O oh God, let us take advantage of this privilege, O oh God, to confess our sins, Lord Jesus. Forgive anything that we have done wrong, O oh God. Forgive anything that is coming from our mouth that did not please you, Lord Jesus. Forgive anything that we have watched, O oh God, we have thought, O oh God, that did not please you, Lord God. O oh God, come, O oh Lord Jesus, by the blood that we shed on Calvary, Wash away our wrongdoing, O oh God. Do not let anything hinder you to come and bless your people tonight. And bless your people, O oh God, in your presence. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we love you. We appreciate you that you are, we are here so we can get closer to you, Lord Jesus. Answer our prayers. Lord, help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Help us to be born again, O oh God, because you don't have grand, grandchildren. You have only sons and daughters. We want to approach you like our Father. So, oh God, by through, through the new birth, we can be children. We can be daughters and sons. Would you like to come and give to every one of us the true new birth as we are in your presence? Lord Jesus, to commit the whole service into your hand. Would you like to bless, oh God, the men of God who will be standing behind this pulpit, oh God. Put the men aside, Lord Jesus. You know our need. You know every step of our life. And come and speak to every need, oh God, tonight. Come and minister to our souls, oh God, tonight. We're calling upon your name, oh God. Come among us. 
see your people oh god with the hand lifted up oh god different need hidden oh god beyond this hand lifted up would you like to look oh god from above and give every one of us our heart desire and minister to every need oh god tonight you know our heart and you promise to give us our heart desire lord jesus we're calling upon your name now. Come and fill this place with your presence and bless every part of the service, oh God. Bless the body, Joel, as his song leading, Lord God. Anoint him in a special way, Lord Jesus. Send your angel to worship with us together. Bless the musician. Bless the usher at the door. Bless every part of the service. We commit all into your hand, Lord God. We love you. We appreciate you and waiting on you tonight because you ask all these things in the precious name of Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. 828. Give me Jesus. B flat. B flat. 828. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. 
change the order of the service. Amen. Um, that's around all. Seven ninety nine.
surrender this evening in the service, oh God. We surrender all that we are. We have nothing good that we can offer, but we're offering you our lives. We're offering you the breath, oh God, that comes out of my, our mouth. We're offering you our spirit. Lord, we're offering you everything that we are. Come, Lord Jesus, even in this very short time that we have, that you will manifest yourself. Oh God, if there is anything, any interest in our life, Lord Jesus, anything we've done wrong in this life, we pray that you will forgive us. Let there be nothing to hinder you to come and move in our midst. Oh Jesus, we so want you in everything that we do. Come, oh Father, we pray. We commit ourselves, we commit our lives, we commit the service to you. And all that we are, trusting that you will have the preeminence over all, all for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 God bless you. We can take our Bible, the book of Ephesians. Thank you, musician. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and uh, after Ephesians chapter 2, we read uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, that we've been reading uh, lately. can follow along. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verse 21 and verse 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And when he say in you, put your name there. You are not just an individual, but as Paul we say, you were builded. Your life was shaped, was builded to uh, and framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And also you were built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Someone will define your life as, as many ways. Science can have a different way of defining what life is, what human life is, but to you and I who believe this message, our life has a simple definition. It's an habitation of the Almighty God, the Holy Ghost, to come and dwell in. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, uh, we read this scripture uh, a few times. We probably will be closing on this thought tonight, Lord willing. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, if you find the book of Habakkuk uh, from Malachi, you go Zephariah, Agai, I guess, Zephaniah, and then Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let's bow our head one more time. Oh Jesus, you are holy God and we come before you not because of ourselves, but because of your choice. You have chosen us. We did not choose you, but you did choose us. 
We did not seek you, but you sought us and you find us. Oh God, we pray now, even in this little place, may your presence be filled. We commit ourselves to you. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We count this a great honor before the Lord uh, to be able to stand uh, before you. Uh, it's uh, we're away last, last weekend. We went to visit the saints in Adao, and we had a good time there. There was uh, three young men that was young people that was baptized for the same family and it was just a, uh, a a blessing to be there it was actually kind of a special weekend for me uh, and I, I really thank the lord that if there is a way you can celebrate another year in your life is to try to do something for the kingdom of god that you know a uh, few young people can give their heart to the lord jesus and desire to be baptized and give the heart to serve the Lord. Actually, one of them were just talking and I asked just to be curious what, you know, brought you to come to that decision. You know, certainly there came a time where there was a conviction in the heart, uh, but, you know, I just like the answer that one of them, she gave me. She said that she just wanted to get more closer to God. And she believed that by taking that step and that decision, it's going to just uh, draw her more closer to God. And I believe that's a desire of any believer is to get more closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing of this life can satisfy us. Our only satisfaction is when we are in his presence. And I trust that that's the desire that will never be uh, uh, go away in our heart as believers to just want to be closer to God. Even this evening, we just pray, if, if it will be just one word or, or two, that we help you to get more closer to God. And God is not in number. God is not in a special day. God is not in a special place. You know, God is infinite. God can come and meet you in, in a time where there is probably not a lot of people. God can come and meet you at a time where might not be a special day or what. God is, is God. You cannot put him in a box. And we just want to free ourselves tonight and trust that he will come and he will meet us. Amen. We consider this a great privilege to stand um, before you and we thank the Lord for that. Last time we were speaking and this will be probably a close of this thought. Uh, this uh, thought, he is in his temple. And if you will uh, remember the title, uh, it will be probably part three, and uh, we we'll probably will close in this thought. In the title, there is uh, uh, everything belongs to God. Uh, in my title, when I say He is that God in His temple, it's not somebody else's temple, but that temple belongs to Him and is there in His temple. Last Friday, uh, I spoke here as uh, we were thinking of the great almighty God. You know, Brother Barnum said that there is seven dimension, and not to uh, go back on that, but we all know God dwell in the seventh dimension. And there is no record in the Bible or in the message of people going and living there. So it seems to be a holy place of God where the archangels, those who are there in God's service, they will bow their head. They, they look at themselves so unworthy, so unclean, to be there in the presence of the Almighty God. And he dwell there. But you will find that as we be going with you in the scripture, it never satisfied God to dwell in that dimension. With all the glory that he could receive, with all the... the, the the praise and all the, uh, the glory that he could receive, he was not pleased by that. As you will know the story in the book of Genesis, uh, maybe you can turn with me. In the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 2, right after God finished the creation, because the Almighty God 
want you to see his attribute being manifested. Now just imagine, it's not to say that this is what God thinks, but I will say, as human beings in our thought, just imagine all that you know is that someone coming and give you praise. Someone coming and give you praise. For millions of years, uh, uh, billions of years, holy, holy is our God. Holy, holy is our God. Holy, holy is our God. You know, probably the first few times you'll be ex uh, exalted about it. But at a certain time, you, you, you want something more than that. And I'm just thinking as a human being, you want something more. There is something that craving, there, there, there is just more than holiness in me. There is just more than power. There is just more than uh, uh, or whatever that, 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 that those beings are seeing about me. And God was having that craving. And the craving was not just to be uh, considered as a holy God, but his craving or his desire, his longing was to manifest his attribute. This will be, uh, this is uh, somewhat like something very simple uh, for believers of the message. He wanted to manifest his attribute. In him there was an attribute of being a healer. In him was an attribute of being uh, uh, the redeemer. In him was the attribute of being the savior. There was all plenty, uh, it's unlimited the attributes of God. It, it's unlimited the potential of our God. So there is so much that Brother Bonham even said that it will take us a all eternity to discover our God. So it will take us a all eternity to find out even more of the attribute of God. In this life, we know this much, but there is just so much, so unlimited, that it will take us a all eternity. And we know eternity has no end. So which meaning that there is no way that you will fully know God in his power, in his potential. But now he was there in that dimension, all being holy, holy. But God said, I need to step up. There has to come a time where I will manifest my attribute. And now we study the creation. We know God created uh, heaven and earth. I'm not going to go back to that. It's a very common thing, very simple for us to know. And he created for six days. He created, uh, 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 he studied with the botanic life and, and, and then the animal kingdom and, you know, all the forms of the earth and everything. And on the six days, he created man. He created man in his image, in his likeness. But now watch, the Bible says in verse uh, 2 of chapter 2, And on the seventh day, God handed his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So finally God is in his heart after he has made man in his image. Because the, uh, the verses that come, the chapter that come before, he was after his, he has made man. After God created man in his image. On the seventh day there was no more creation to be done. But the only thing that was expressed to God, he found a time of rest. God found rest on the seventh day. Rest for all of his work. Rest for all everything that he has done. And I was puzzling myself in my mind. I'm thinking, how will God who never get tired find the rest? You know, when you, you read that, you will think like he, he got so exhausted. Then you say, well, let me take a nap. Uh, let, me, let me take some rest. How will God find the rest? How will God rest like us human beings? So in another way, if you, uh, 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 you, 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 you go uh, and, and look into the, the glasses of the scripture, you will find that the rest of God is when he can enjoy his, his creation. And the fullness of God's creation was humankind, Adam and Eve. Now the rest of God was when he can sit down and fellowship with his son. And fellowship with his creation. And fellowship with Adam and Eve. Then God can say that I am fully satisfied with what I have made. I can talk to him. He's thinking like me. 
I can commune with him. He's talking, he's thinking like me. His love is like me. His thought process is like me. Adam could have come one time I spoke with you. He will come at the eve of a day. God will come and ask Adam, what happened? What did you do today? You know, Adam will look and say, you know what, Father? I was walking. I saw this mountain out there, over there, and I thought this mountain was not supposed to be there. And I just spoke to this mountain, move from this place and go back to the other way. And the mountain moved, and then I make a way this way. And then I look around, and I saw this animal. It was so big and so powerful. And I look at the nature of this animal, and I call him Leo the lion. I call him this. I call this one this. And God look, he will say, this is my expression now. That's, what, that's my thought being expressed. God did not name the animals. God did not name, but he, 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 he could have seen through Adam the expression of his thought. The expression of what he was thinking. Adam continued the works of God. And God was seeing the fulfillment of his attribute in the life of Adam. Now he found the peace. He found rest. He can say, now I rest. Not that I am tired, but I see the continuation of my work. I see the person that I have created being in my image, being in my likeness, and I can come. We can talk together on things that concern us. But what I'm saying, just as the Holy Ghost was there to govern all, all, all the, the entire uh, universe, to create all, the entire universe, to govern the church, God also placed Adam on, in Eden to be like a little God to the rest of the creation. And that was the continuation of God's work. And God found his rest on the seventh day. Not that he was tired, but he found his rest because he can fellowship with his children. He can fellowship, he can commune with Adam and Eve being there in Eden. That was the rest of God. Now let's turn in uh, Isaiah chapter 66. Uh, we read those things last time we spoke. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 1. Bible say, Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstone. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? So you see, the whole thing changed now. Not as if God was complaining, but he was yearning for a place where he can rest. If, you were fo if you've been following along with me, as I was speaking about Genesis, the Bible say openly in uh, verse, uh, two, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, that God found his rest on the seventh day. And now, the same God, by the mouth of Isaiah, He's saying, where is the place of my rest? Where is the house that you have built in me? Where is the place? Not like I will get tired. Not like I will get, I, 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 you know, I, I overwork. God will never overwork. He never get tired. If he done something today, is uh, it, it, it's more than 24-7. He's always present. He does not get tired. He does not get overwork. But he said, where is the place where I can come and I can find a rest. Where all the works that I see, all the things that I see, will be a continuation of what I had in my mind. Will be a continuation of the attribute that I have in my heart. Where is that place of rest? Israel was going on. They have all kinds of things. The temple was there, but the Bible said that the, the, they make a temple like a, the temple was full of vomit. The temple was full of things that we give the offerings without, uh, not from their heart. 
They will do all kinds of things, not from their hearts. And God will look at that and say that the table is full of vomit. I have no, no, uh, no, no place to dwell there. The table was there, but I couldn't go there. The, I cannot find the rest there. Isaiah could have said, or the children of Israel could have answered Isaiah and said, but there is a temple there. But God does not find a satisfaction there because of the worship. And everything that they were doing was so out of the mind of God. He couldn't find the rest. Then the call and the yearning of God was, where is the place of my rest? Where is the place of my satisfaction? Where is the place where I can fully be rested? He was yearning to find that place. Just as he had with Adam, he could have said that the seventh day is the day that I have found a place of rest. I found a man. I found a child. I found someone in my likeness, in my image, that I can come and I can rest with him. But in this Isaiah, he is looking for a place where he can come and rest. In another way, he is looking for a place where he can come and commune with men. Where he can come and fellowship with men. A place where he will be the father. He will come and he will sit down and he will talk to his children about what happened in the days. He will talk to the children about what he had in his mind. It's not about a church. I'm, I'm trying to get ahead of myself here. It's not about just a church. It's not just about a place or a location, but a, 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 a dwelling place of God where God can come and start communing with his children. Just like Jacob one time, he was burning in his heart. He went on to a place and he prayed all night. He was yearning. And then he was sitting there. He, he fell on his, uh, asleep. The Bible says he had a dream. And in a dream, he saw a ladder that, that was uh, set up to heaven. An angel was ascending and descending, going up and going down. What happened? He found a place of rest. And he said, this place will be called Bethel, the house of God. Why? Because God can come and commune with me. The angel will ascend. They will take my burden. They will go up to God with the burden. And they will come back down with the answer. God will come uh, and he will come and he will open the door and come and wash uh, 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 and fellowship with me and commune with me. Jacob looked at the place and he said, this is a dreadful place. It's a holy place. And I'm going to call this the house of God. Bethel. Where God has come and confirmed that he found the rest in my life. He found the rest. And that is vice versa. Where God found the rest, you too found the rest. Where God found the peace, you too found the peace. What happened? In that time, there was no more struggles. There was no more, uh, there was no more questions. There was no more worry. The things of this life can come. The things of this life can go. Those things does not bother you anymore. Why? Because you are in the hands of the Almighty God. And you know that where I am, it's a, 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 a most secure place. That they can be on earth. It's the most secure and the most safe place that they can be. In this place, I will talk to my father. In this place, he will talk back to me. In this place, he's giving me his thoughts. He's giving me his mind. He's giving me what he has in mind. He's revealing himself to me in that place. Jacob found that place. And he said, this is a place of the humanity God. And I'm going to call this place Bethel. We read with you uh, last time, Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. I'm not going to go deep on explaining it. I did that, I believe, last time we spoke. The Bible said, And there... I will meet with thee. That's Moses speaking to the children of Israel. And it's, uh, uh, if you start from verse 25, the Bible said that, uh, verse 1, uh, the Bible said that, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. 
with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which shall take of them. And then he started naming all those offerings. And if you find out that all those that they were bringing, whether it be gold, whether they be a, a, a wood, special wood, or special whatever, they, bring it, they were bringing it to build a place, to build the tabernacle. And now God tell Moses, I explained it last time, all the, 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 uh, the shape and the structures of how the tabernacle is supposed to be. God tell Moses, this is how you're supposed to do it. This is how you're supposed And this was not just some ideas. But God took the man of God, he took the prophet of God, and lifted him up into the seven dimension where God was sitting. And he said, Moses, look. Look how the archangels sit. Look how the cherubim, they have the wings crossed together. Look how the mercy seat is. Look where I'm dwelling. And he said, you will have a perfect copy down on earth. And Moses was copying exactly what was holy over there on the other dimension. And he was not doing it just in his own, in his own mind. But that was the design, the blueprint of God himself. Now verse 22, the Bible said, And there, after you build, you build everything, and there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from the above the mercy seat, from between the cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in a commandment unto the children of Israel. So Moses, after he viewed everything, after he made uh, 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 all the design and all those, uh, uh, those, those structures and things and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 the images and, uh, and, 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 and the statues and all the, the things that are supposed to be there, he was not just haphazardly. He was made and designed from heaven. And Moses, after he viewed that, God said, this is the place where I will come and I will meet with thee. This is a place where I will come and I will commune with thee. I will love to have fellowship with you in this place. In another way, if you follow along with me, this is the place where I can come and I will rest. Where I can come and I will find myself a place of rest. I will find myself, I will call this to be my place. You know, just to kind of go ahead of myself. Many nations came, they took over Israel, and this uh, uh, place, one nation, the Philistines, one time, they did it, the mistake. They came and they destroyed, they, they, they overtook Israel. Israel was in sin in time of Samuel and Eli, the prophet. It, they, they were in sin. And then uh, uh, God uh, 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 let the, 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 the Philistines come in and take over. The Bible said that they took the mercy seat. They took the Ark of the Covenant. And as they, were to, they took the Ark of the Covenant, they were going out. A woman that was pregnant, she cried, Ichabod, the glory of God is gone. The glory of God, the presence of God, the resting place of God has left Israel. Now, that presence was a blessing to the children of Israel, but not to the other people. It was a curse for them. And it's so funny. The first time I read it, I was pretty young. And it, I just, you know, died laughing when I, I read it. You can go read it, I believe, in the book of First Samuel. I uh, can't really recall the exact chapter, but it's uh, at the beginning of the ministry of Samuel. What happened? As soon as the, the, uh, 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 the ark was in the, in the hands of the Philistines, to the children of Israel, it was a blessing. The presence of God was there. God will come and dwell, and they will have ministers. They will have a, a, a priest going on. They will have all kinds of things. God will come and bless them. But to the Philistines, it become a curse. They all start having stomachache. They have hemorrhage. They have all kinds of troubles. They couldn't survive. Why? Because they had something that was not belong to them. It was not supposed to be there. And I would just, when I was a kid, just... 
dying laughing. Just imagine the whole nation, all of them running to the bathroom, all of them having troubles from the king all the way down. Why? Because they having the blessing was not for them. God never found a rest for the Philistines, the Palestine. But the resting place was to the children of Israel. The resting place was to the sons of Jacob, was to the sons of Israel, was for those that God has selected, the few one. But to the rest, it was a curse. And they took the same, that, that, that Ark of the Covenant. They bring it before the God. Oh, look what our God has done. You know, our God has destroyed Israel. Now we have the, the, we are sub, we, we, we are, they are submissive to us. And they put our Ark in the presence of the God. That was Dagon. And that God was telling there at night, a statute. The next day they come in the morning, they find the dead, the, the, the statue on the floor, on the ground. And I was wondering, what happened? That little ark of the covenant was not just some piece of wood. Now you have the piece of wood of the God of, 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 of the Philistines, and you have God, the man who told Israel to design these things. They took maybe the same material as the, uh, as the Philistines did to build the statue and everything, but this one was designed from heaven. The same material, but a different designer. God himself was the designer. And as soon as he stood there, that Dagon girl fell down. And they came, they thought, maybe something happened. Maybe it was loose, uh, uh, out of balance. Maybe let's put something to secure this uh, our God in this way. Maybe let's put this, uh, this more safe and uh, this more uh, thing to secure. And the next day, they came down and the God was down again. And they came out, they realized we have something that we should not have supposed to have. Now, to you to see, I'm not talking about that uh, the Israel was worshipping that uh, ark, but I'll say the design of the ark. They took probably the same materials, but the design was the inspiration of God. The design was coming from heaven, was not the man man of men or an idea of Moses and some, some sacrifice, uh, some priest, but it was a design from heaven. And because of that, the result was different because of the presence of God. Let me just tell you, we might have the same flesh, we might have the same bones, we might have the same eyes, we might have the same clothing. We might look uh, the same way as the people out there. But I'm here to tell you, you are designed from heaven. Your structure might look maybe ugly compared to the rest. You might look maybe not attractive compared to the other people. But the difference here is you were designed from heaven. You did not just come here by chance. You did not were just born here. But you were perfectly designed from heaven. To be placed here on earth, to be the dwelling place of God. My structure might be the same, but the, the designer of my life, he had only one Daniel in his mind. He had only one you in his mind. There is no two. There is, you are not uh, like, uh, uh, no, God is going to make a better you. No, you are the mind, the perfect mind of God for your time, for this moment. And God will design you, though the structure, though the, 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 the thing might be different, uh, might, might look similar, but there is a difference. We were designed from up above. We were designed from heaven. Our life was not just supposed to be like the other, but we were designed from heaven to live a perfect image of God here on earth. That's why when you stand up in front of a problem, that's why you stand up in front of uh, 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 some troubles. Paul could have said, hey, look, I don't have money. I don't have wealth. I don't have knowledge. I'm not popular. I'm not known. But you stand there, we stand in front of people and we say, who can take away the love of God in my life? What can separate me from the love that I have with my Lord Jesus? And he start naming. He said, is it troubles? No. Is it tribulation? No. Is it famine? No. Is it being broke? Is it uh, any kind of the things of trials of this life? Is it misunderstanding? Is it being hatred? Is it being cast away? Nothing of this life can separate me from the love that I have toward Jesus Christ. What is the anchor 
Because I was designed from the Almighty God. I was created to be the kind of person I am. And there is nothing, no trouble on this life that can take it away from me. The Philistines tried, but they couldn't. They had to stop and they thought, they thought, man, this God, maybe it was a piece of wood. This piece of wood, it's greater than we ever thought. They look similar, but it's greater. What was making it greater? The anointing of God that was upon it. And the same way with you too. Though trouble might come, it might be sickness, it might be disease, it might be all kinds of problems. That Satan, that demon will be like, I cannot, I cannot keep this for long. I have this body for many times. I give him all kind of worry. I give him all kind of disease. I give him all kind of problem. All these things keep backfiring in me. God is receiving more glory through the sickness. God is receiving more glory to the trouble that I'm giving them. God is receiving more glory to all the pain that I'm causing. One day that demon will say, I'm giving up. Amen. Why? Because not because of you, but because the anointing of God that dwells in the temple. You were designed to give glory to Jesus Christ. Your life give glory to Jesus Christ. When you go to troubles, when you go to difficulties, when you go to up and down, all those things was prepared, was ordained, was designed by the Almighty God so that the name of Jesus Christ will be lifted up through your life. You are not living a life by chance. Nothing. There is no Christian that ever lived a life by chance. You go to troubles, you go to pain, you go to tribulation. It was ordained, designed for God to receive glory to my life. And that will give you the opportunity to see your life completely different. That's why a Christian, when he goes to trials, he does not go to trial crying all the time. He does not go to trial looking down all the time. But when he goes to trials, he look up, up to heaven. Because you know my redemption is coming now. You know that the answer is coming now. God will not leave me in this situation just to cast me down. But he's giving me to go to these trials so that the name of Jesus Christ will be lifted up at the end. That as I'm walking, like we heard last time, like while Job was walking there, he go to a lot of trials. He did not know anything. He, knew, he did not know that there was, a, there was a fighting over there in heaven between God and Satan. And all the kingdom of hell was there against one man, Job. All the kingdom of hell, all the trials, all the pain, all the suffering, all the difficulties came upon one single man, and that was Job. But Job, as he was going to trials, he was going to all the pain. His wife looked at him and he said, just curse God and then just die. But Job said, I am not going to die like a coward. I don't understand what's going on. I cannot see what's going on. But down in my heart, I know one thing. My redeemer liveth. I don't know I cannot see it with my eyes. But I know one day, he shall stand over the other side. And I will see him. And I will know why all these trials are going on. The same way also, the bride of Jesus Christ. The presence of God has come so anointing the, uh, the, the bride of Christ in this age to give us the ability. Though I might not understand what's going on. Though I might not see, I might not have the answer for everything. You are not supposed to have all the answer. God is not obligated to give you all the answer of everything. But I know down in my heart, one of these days, I shall see the glory of God. Mighty God to the trial that I'm going through. I will see the glory of God through the life that I'm going through. Because why? My life is not a chance. But my life was ordained and prepared by God to be a temple of the living God. In the book of Matthew chapter 1, uh, we're going to take a little switch here. Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 1 first and then 
I read verse 16 and verse uh, 18. Verse 1, the Bible says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And now he start naming the generation of Jesus Christ. From Abraham, we get Isaac, and on and on and on. Now if you jump to verse 16, he said, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So that was the end of the generation of Jesus Christ. We know, uh, figuratively, we can say Joseph was his father, though we know that he was not. But now pay attention to verse 17. So all the generation from Abraham, if you follow with me, from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon and to Christ are 14 generations. And it's so amazing, he stopped there. And now I start talking about the birth of Jesus. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So I was very touched when I was studying this and thinking, I know we're just going to try to close this thought. God started by talking about the generation of Jesus Christ. How he came and the name all the people that was all like the great grandfather of Jesus Christ, meaning the great grandfather of Joseph. And now in verse 17, it gave a condensed number of the generation of Jesus Christ. There were 14 generations from Abraham all the way to David. And we know 14 uh, as you know, simple math, it's seven and seven. So God has seven, a seven generation somewhere there, and then seven generation from Abraham all the way to David. And there was a pause there. Amen. I trust that you probably will catch it as I did. And then he continues to say that from David all the way to the captivity was another 14 generation. So another seven generation and another seven generation. 14 generation. And from the time of captivity and to the birth of Jesus Christ was another 14 generation. Another seven generation and another seven. And then right after that, the birth of Jesus Christ was likewise. Now follow with me. God at seven days, after seven days, the Bible says on the seventh day, he, he, built, uh, he created heaven and earth. He created man for six days. On the seventh day, God rested. And now the Bible says, after 14 generations, after seven generations, and another seven generations, there was something that happened. David came on the scene. Follow with me. 14 generations passed, David came on the scene. But if you read in the book of Exodus, I'm not bringing a new doctrine, it's just a scripture. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. We all know this story. This is how the children of Israel were living before they leave Egypt. After God gave the plague to the, to, uh, the, the, the Egyptians, the, 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 uh, we know Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. And then he kept the children of Israel for another long time. God told the children of Israel, this is the final sign now. And this one was the final blow to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. 
Now God gave them an instruction. And he said, ye shall keep, uh, 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 verse 5, uh, let's start from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of the month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregations of Israel, saying, In the tenth days of this month, they shall take of uh, to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers. A lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the numbers of his soul, of the souls. Every man according to his hearing shall make you your count for the lamb. Now verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep, from the goat, and verse 6, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So the lamb, who was a sign of the freedom of Israel, he was supposed to be kept 14 days before he got killed in the evening. And we know God always dwells in seven. Seven being the perfect number of God. But now as the children of Israel was leaving, the Bible said it was the feast of the, uh, of the Pentecost. They were leaving. They remember that day of the deliverance. They will always celebrate that day. It was a time where they will go and fellowship with God. A time where they will go and they have their communion with God. A time where they were free from the bondage. They were free from all the slavery. They were free from all the things. But God was respecting the numbers. He said the lamb will be kept for 14 days. And now Matthew worrying the generation of Jesus Christ, he did not just word this number by chance, but he said from the time of Abraham all the way to the time of, of David, there was 14 generations. And then he named another generation from David to the time of the captivity, there was another 14 generation. And in, uh, from uh, the time of captivity, all the way to the birth of Jesus Christ, there was another 14 generations. I'm not trying to worry your mind, but if you took all this, you will see that there was seven and seven, seven and seven, seven and seven. There was 16 or six gener of seven generations that did line up. In these three generations. But now when it came the seventh generation. Of the dispensation that God has to the children of Israel. At the seventh generations. Because at six days God created man. He created, the, he created heaven and earth. On the six days man was created. But on the seventh day God came and said. I'm not doing any creation. I'm finding my rest here. But now Matthew writing down the generation of Jesus Christ. And he said to people, this did not happen by chance. But he, God always followed the pattern that he had in the Bible. In the world, now he took six generations of seven days, of seven uh, 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 generations. He took it seven, and then on the sixth generation, there was no creation. Yeah. There was nothing to tell. But the very first verse, the second verse that came, the Bible said, the birth of Jesus Christ was likewise. What happened? The same Lamb of God, just like the children of Israel, they keep the Lamb for 14 days. And Moses tell them, in the evening time, you will kill the Lamb. And the Lamb will be a sign of your freedom. You will take the blood of the Lamb. You will put him on the length of your house. You will put it at the door. And when the angel of death will pass by, when I shall see the blood, I will pass over you. I will not kill you. But now Mo Matthew, writing down, and he said, at the sixth of the seventh generation that God has given to the children of Israel, came the true Lamb of God. Jesus Christ was born on the seventh days, on the seventh generation, 
is born as the Prince of Peace. Is born as the solution for all the troubles that Israel could have had. In another way, God is telling Israel, in the same pattern that I use to save you from your bondage, to save you from your captivity, I will use the exact same pattern. I use all these people as a pattern to show to you at the birth of this man, this is my only chosen son to whom I am pleased to dwell in. From this person, as the lamb will be shedding his blood, as the lamb will be killed in the evening, as the blood will be shed, you will be free from your captivity. You will be free from anything I have abandoned you. You will be free from any condition. All that you have to do, any condition that you might have, you take the blood of Jesus. Apply it upon your doors. Apply it upon your life. Apply it upon the situation. And when the death angel will start passing by, when the trouble will start passing by, when they shall see the blood of Jesus Christ, apply as a token on the seventh day, at the day of peace, then I will pass by. The trouble will not enter in, but I will pass by, and you will be saved, not because of your own merit, not because of your ability, but because of the blood that was shed at Calvary, because of the presence of the lamb that was given. And the lamb was killed at the seventh, at the end of the generation. Jesus, as the lamb of God, was killed at the end of Israel's generation. Amen. And now we see God who had, like I spoke in, my beginning, in the beginning of this thought, God has in his desire to want to fellowship with humankind. He created Adam and he said, I found peace. I found rest. Now I can rest. Now I can talk with that person. Now I can commune. If you follow, I don't want to worry your mind, but if you follow as I was reading, uh, studying this on uh, the book of Matthew, you will see that Abraham offered sacrifice to God in a place in Mamre. And he called that, 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 that place and he was worshipped. It was between uh, uh, Bethel and Ai, I believe, the place. And every time Abraham will come, he will go to some troubles. He will always remember, God met me in this place. And he will come back and find his rest there. Now, 14 generations, going back to what we read, David came in his heart. David had in his heart, he said, I am going to build a temple for God. The first human being to have that desire to build a temple for God. God told David, because you shed a lot of blood, I am not going to let you, but your son will come and will build a temple. The temple of David was built. God came in the book of Chronicles. He came through some, uh, 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 Solomon and he rested there. They said the pit of fire came. The glory of God came. The, uh, uh, the, 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 the priest couldn't do anything because of the presence of God was filling this enti the entire place, the entire building. Now the Bible says, from the time of Israel, or of David, all the way to the time of captivity, the temple was destroyed. God did not stop there. He rose up people, Ezra, Nehemiah, and uh, Joshua, uh, 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 and all those other people, Zerubbabel, they built it another temple. And God came and found a place of rest. But now, from the time of the temple that was built, all the way to the time of Jesus, Jesus was now the fulfillment of all the resting place of God. Jesus was the embodiment. His body was the temple of God. He could have looked at the scribe, the Pharisees, and he would tell them, you destroy this temple. In three days, I will rebuild it. They look around, they were thinking, maybe it's about this temple. He said, no, you destroy this temple. God has built a temple, a place where he can come and find his pleasure. A place where he can come and he can fellowship. A place where he can come and find communion. Now when the disciples were there in a Mount Transfiguration, Jesus Christ rose up. Amen. And they came Moses. 
they came by Elijah on the side of Jesus. And as they were standing there, Peter looked up just like a man. And he thought, let us build three temples. That's what came in the mind of, uh, 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 of Peter. Why? Because he was a religious man. You know that because of what I'm seeing, God will be pleased on the temple. Now he said, let us build three temples. One temple for Moses, one temple for Jesus, one temple for Elijah. Amen. The Bible says, as soon as he spoke that, God took away Moses. He took away uh, Elijah. And he left only Jesus there. And he said, this is my beloved son, to whom I'm choose to dwell in. It's not about the temple of Moses. It's not about the temple of Elijah. It's not about some specific revelation. But this is the temple that I have choose. Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus Christ is the only temple that I am choose to come and dwell in. In Christ, it was the fullness of God coming to find his rest in the life of, the, of Jesus. Amen. I don't want to stop here. I want to continue. I still have probably five minutes or so. Let me just get to a close here. I know this sounds like a mathematics or physics or whatever. But it's the word of God. And I was just enjoying myself thinking of this. We probably will get somewhere. I'm trying to close here. Now, the thought of God never been to just dwell in Jesus. And Jesus departing and ascending up to, to, to his father. And then that's it. But the thought of God will ride with you. In the book of Ephesians, if you can turn with me. The thought of God, Paul says, in whom ye also build it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The same way as God used all this temple, the physical one, the one that man could have seen. But now Jesus becoming the person that God can come and dwell in. God also promised you as an individual, you as a people. Jesus says before he leave, and he said that the time will come, and the hour is already come. Where the, you will see the Father be in me, me in the Father, and me in you, and you in me. Amen. God always longing for that time where he can take the true temple of God. There has to be the blood of Christ to come, to wash from the sin. So that the temple that was born from flesh, that was born from sin, that was born from iniquity, that was born from speaking lie, God can come and take that temple. He will purify that temple. He will sanctify that temple. And God, the same God, will come and dwell into that temple. This is not a myth, but it's a reality. But when I'm saying this message, uh, so that I'm in prison, he said the ministry must be the same. In so much that he said, I see some of you writing scripture down. St. John 14, 12. He that believe in me, the works that I do shall he do also. And he said, see the works, preaching to the lost, healing the sick, and then to the impossible to ever be saved. See, the works went on just the same. So this has been, as this been, may I put it like this, the ministry of Jesus Christ reincarnated in the church in the last day. That's what many of us believe. I believe with you. I believe this. The ministry of Jesus Christ, the same God who was dwelling in a temple called Jesus, now being reincarnated in this last age. And the prophet said, if I didn't believe it, 
I'll do something else about it. Because after all, this is me that's concerned in here. And if the Spirit of God are being you, you are concerned about the people. God in his mind did not want to just dwell there in Jesus. And Jesus being ascended, going back to the Father. But the desire of God is to take a temple. Is to take men and women, born and shaped in iniquity, that God can take that person. He will wash that person by the blood of Jesus Christ. He will purify. He will wash that person. And the same Almighty God, the same ministry of God, will come and be reincarnated into the people, into the church. This would have been another service uh, of all. But Abraham took that scripture and then separated it and he said, this is concerning me. It is true that God will use, he will have his ministry reincarnated into the people, into the church, but God has a wave sheaf. He will have one person that he can dedicate it he will come and anoint that person. He will come and fool that person with his presence. That same ministry, the authentic ministry of Jesus Christ, being reincarnated in a human being. Now you see, God with Adam, God with fellowship with a man. Adam had no sin. Adam had no father. He had no mother. Adam was not born by sexual desire. Adam was not the scripture that said, well, I was born and shaped in iniquity. That did not concern Adam. Adam was a perfect man, to say. He was perfectly in his way. He was perfect in his flesh. There was no sin in Adam. But God will come, separated from Adam, and he will commune with Adam. He will talk with Adam. Amen. But now came... The second Adam, Jesus Christ. Just like Adam, he was not born of man. He was not born, even though he came through a woman, but he was not born of a cell of a woman. In Jesus was not fulfilled that scripture that said, Behold, I was born and shaped in iniquity. That did not concern Jesus. His flesh was perfect before God. His life was perfect before God. His, his mind, his thought was perfect before God. God could have come and dwell into the vessel. And that was the temple of the living God. But amen. We read here the Bible said, in the book of uh, 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 Habakkuk chapter uh, uh, 2 that we read, the Lord now has descended in his temple. Let all the earth be silent. I introduced here, uh, I introduced that uh, a month ago when I was studying with this scripture, uh, this thought. What will make the earth be silent? In a book of Revelation, just for the sake of time, you don't need to turn. They saw a great event that happened. Revelation chapter 8. All the, uh, Revelation chapter 7, God started breaking the seals. He broke the first seal. He break the second seal. He break the, uh, the fourth and the, the, the fifth and the sixth. And there were all kinds of signs. There were all kinds of things that would happen. But the Bible says, at the breaking of the seven seals, there was a silence of about half an hour. What was going on in that half an hour? What about them say that the same Jesus was living heaven, was living his throne, to come down. In Revelation chapter 10, Jesus was coming down. And he caused the whole earth to be silent. What was causing the whole earth to be silent? The God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, he took a flesh. Amen. I trust that you can follow this. He took a flesh. A man with Adam, we read with you, the scripture that said, born and ship in iniquity was not concerning Adam, was not concerning Jesus. But God to prove that he is the almighty God, there is nothing impossible to God. He takes 
amen that that scripture will be fulfilled upon. Born and shaped in iniquity. Born of sin. A man that born of a father that we drink. That had no religious background. That had no, nothing of religion connection with them. His mother, half Indian. There was no religious connection there. There was no upbringing of religious. There was no someone that can come and say, well, I preach them the gospel. Or I show them the Bible. There was no Bible there. There was nothing there that you can connect there. But God, the Mary, he proved, I can take out of this stone. I can take out of this flesh. I can take out of this nothing. I will build myself a temple. A temple where me, God, or Mary, not half God, not part of God, not just I'm anointed of God, but your Mary, God. We said, I will take this stone, born, shape. In iniquity. For the first time, God will pick up a flesh, born and shape in iniquity. That you will look around, you see no background. You see nothing to connect this religious background. Jesus, his father, we know religious people. We know about the birth, uh, the, uh, the birth of how uh, Adam was created. We know all these things. There was some spiritual connection. But here, out of no connection there, but God proven there is nothing impossible to God. And he chose that person. Amen. Out of nowhere, in a dark morning, of a seven, or, 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 or probably about 4, 4 a.m. or 5 a.m., when there was so kind of darkness, when there was nothing, no connection, no priest, no word, no Bible, no nothing, but on the six days of April, came the pillar of fire coming down. And it did not rest on everyone else. The pit of fire came. The baby who did not know anything. The man who did not know anything. The father who had no background. But the pit of fire came and rested upon the man. Upon that baby. To prove to humanity. To prove to all religious men. To prove to the entire story of the plan of redemption of God. That God can take something out of nothing and make a temple out of it. Amen. There is no connection there. Amen. There is nothing that you can bring about religion there. But it was the sovereign choice of God. Amen. He said, behold now, I have found myself. Not I have found myself, but I have built myself a temple. Amen. And now from that person, fulfill the scripture that we read with you in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk could have seen the Lord God Almighty living there in the seventh dimension. All the archangels going holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. That pillar of fire that came. All the glory of God. But now all those glory of God came down to dwell in a temple. To dwell in a human body. To fulfill Revelation 10, 7. To fulfill Luke 17, 30. The Lord God of Mary dwell in the temple. Now when the man stand up, amen. I hope you keep your balance. That was not just a man talking. That was not just a man talking. That was your mighty God himself. The creator of heaven and earth speaking to humankind. My brother and my sister, this message that we have received, it's not just some prophecy. It's not just some burning around prophecy. It's not just some ideas or some inspiration that I have, I have got or whatever. But this message that we have received is your mighty God himself who left the seventh dimension and dwell in a person to speak to you and I. What privileged people we are. We became the dwelling place of God. When you receive this message, when you receive this word, I was going to read to you uh, this quote. But, but I'm saying, what it is, it's a building of, of a church of God himself. Let me just read it as we come to a close. Musician can come. Uh, you can come, brother. I'm sorry. We're never going to finish this talk, so you might just say, well, come. But, but I'm saying this message in the message of grace. And he said, and we know that the scripture says that Jesus Christ 
is the chief cornerstone and is also the headstone. Now, if we will think for a few minutes that the seventh church messengers was to restore the faith of the children back to the fathers. In other words, amen, rebuilding the church again under the power of the spirit, not by my power, not by my mind, but by the spirit, save the Lord. Amen. God, God, the purpose. I was going to read to you Revelation chapter 21 or 22. At the end of all the, the finish of the work of man, the plan of redemption, the Bible said there was a voice that came out of the temple. There was a voice that came out of the bride. There is a voice that came out of the people of God. God sent us a message. He sent us the word. He sent us the seventh messenger to rebuild the church of Christ, to rebuild the temple of God, the temple that was destroyed all throughout the ages. You know, the religious thought, the religious mind came. They destroyed the temple. They bring on Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They bring on all kinds of doctrines. They bring on all kinds of things. But God came. The same Almighty God. And he said, I am going to take a man and I'm going to rebuild my church. I am going to rebuild my, my temple. I am going to satisfy my temple. And that's the temple of God being satisfied. It's been sanctified. It's been washed. It's been preserved. It's been changed. Then the God Almighty can come and dwell in the temple. You and I are the most privileged people. I know this message seems to be very hard to swallow in a way, but nevertheless, I find it my heart to speak to you. The temple of God is not this building. Though we love fellowship, it's not how big the church will be, but the temple of God is you as an individual. God sent the message to shape you, to sanctify your life, to wash you so that the Almighty God can dwell in the temple. The Almighty God can fulfill his greatest desire. With Adam, he fellowship, uh, uh, talking with Adam from lips to ears, and Adam talking back. But in this time, God has restored Adam again so that the fellowship can start from within, outside. As you're walking, you're talking with God. You're thinking of his word. You just love his presence. You don't have to lock yourself in somewhere, but his presence come down and he start fellowshipping with you. God finding his rest to you, Sister Jean. God finding his rest to you, Sister O. Finding his rest in your life when you go about your own business. God can shake up all in heaven and say, I have found the flesh. I have found the family. I have found the people that I can come and I can find my rest. Let all the earth be silent. Why? Because God has chosen me. When I was rejected, when I was lost, when I couldn't be found, somewhere, somewhere there in Congo, God picked up a man. He shaped me in his likeness. He shaped me. He designed me perfectly to fulfill my part of duty. He on earth. Same thing with you. You know, the temple went to many places. The temple was destroyed. The temple was going through a lot of things. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, God always called for restoration. The same way also, the devil might have break up your life, break, trying to break your family apart, trying to break your children, trying to break and bring all kinds of things. But I'm here to tell you the message that we have is to restore back the temple. The business of God is to restore your life. That you become the dwelling place of the living God. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. Amen. Let's stand. <clears throat> Let's just sing this song. We are standing on holy ground. Well, the word of God, the inspiration is, is infinite. We never get to finish the thought of God. It's not our business to try to finish thought. But trust that something I was saying tonight was an encouragement to you. Let's all stand. Yes, we are standing on holy ground.
We are standing up for you. I don't know what the enemy might have tried to bring in your life. And I know that his business, his job, is always to point to you, to your failure, to your shortcoming, and things that they went wrong. And he will go and about and battle with your mind. But if there is a word that you can tell the enemy, don't brag about anything, don't look for any solution, but just tell the enemy, tell Satan, I am the temple of the living God. All those troubles that you're bringing in my life, just remember one thing, I am the temple of the living God. Not of my choice, not of my ability, not of anything that I've done, but God chose me to be a temple of the living God. That's enough, my friend, my brother, my sister, will be enough to give you courage to stand against all the evil. If God will love his presence so much, that he have all the angels camping around. In his presence, the Bible says, for those who believe, those who have received, the angel of the Lord is camping around you and walking in your life. It's not you alone walking, but you are a temple of the living God. It's not just your house, but it's the temple of the living God. It's not just a church, but it's a temple of the living God. If you have that, 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 that realization, then what's the point of being afraid? What's the point of being afraid? All those problems that you see, they are merely insignificant in the presence of God. But I'm standing by faith. I know where I'm standing. I am a temple of the living God. Though the world might not understand me, but I know for sure one thing I understand. I am the temple of the living God. You sister, live likewise. Live like a temple. Dress up like a temple. Talk like a temple. You are not just some human being who came up on earth, but your life was prepared, predestinated by God. And you hear, you receive the message. Live like the temple of the living God. Is that your desire tonight? Lord Jesus, I might probably not understand the full message, but I'm standing as your temple. Use me for your kingdom. Use me for your glory. And may there be victory in my life in everything that I will do. Amen. Let's sing this song as we invite our pastor to come. We are standing on holy ground. We are standing
just bow our head all together. If something was said that touched your heart tonight, I can push you to say, Oh God, sanctify me. Sanctify my temple so that I can be ready to be used by you. You saw William Branham anytime, at night, morning, noon, whenever God wanted to use the temple, he could use it. You just could call on the phone, woke up and pick up the phone and start saying, you're calling for this and this and this. He was always ready to be used. Once he seen, he lied to the lawyer and then he went to pray for a baby. God called him a hypocrite. Go back, fix your life, then I'll use you again. Many times we do things that can defile this body and then just pre prevent God to use our body, to use this temple. Would you like just to come tonight and say, Lord, with my hand lifted up, forgive my sins, Lord Jesus. Forgive anything that came out of my mouth that defiled this temple that you redeemed to be used anytime you want. But for my, oh God, because of my nature, it happened that I defied this body by the thing that I watched, by the thing that I thought, by the, that I said, I'm coming back tonight, oh God, forgive me. And I'd like to tell you that he's more than ready to forgive you and come back and use your temple again. Would you like just lift, to lift up your hand and talk to God all together? Lord Jesus Christ, we're coming before you, oh God. We are convinced, Lord Jesus, that what we heard this evening was the pure, clean message from you. With our hand lifted up, oh God, we're coming before you, Lord Jesus. Forgive, oh God, anything that we have done, Lord Jesus, that push you away to come back to your temple. Oh, Lord God, every time that Israel sinned against you, you're always going away. But just waiting for them to repent, oh God. Just waiting for them to come back to you so you can come back to the temple and use it again. Here we are, oh God. This is the final, oh God, step of your plan of redemption. To have a man born in the sin, shape in iniquity, that can be the temple of God. That you can do use day and night. That you can use, oh God, rain, sun, under the sun, under the rain. Anytime, oh God, you can just use it. We coming before you. Like, oh God, in the same field where we, you took William Branham, oh God. Like, you wave it, oh God, that from this field will come a lot of sheaves. Here we are, oh God, in this house with our hand lifted up, Lord Jesus. God, look, look unto us, Lord Jesus, because of the blood we shed on Calvary. This is the moment, oh God. This is the final step. This is the, the, the final step of redemption. We like to lift up our hand before you. Sanctify our bodies, oh God. Sanctify again this temple, Lord Jesus. Come back, oh God, to your temple again. Come back to the temples that we are. We like to worship you in truth, oh God, in spirit. Come and fill our heart, Lord Jesus. Bring us back again to you, Lord God. Use our temple again. Blessed be your name forever, oh God. I we so thankful to you, oh God, to speaking to us, oh God, tonight, Lord Jesus. We are satisfied. We are happy that we will hear from you, Lord Jesus. Bless the ministry of our brother. Oh God, bless him in a special way. Bless his family and bless everything he's trying to do, oh God. Again, oh God, we pray for our little congregation. We don't want to just come here in this house and call our self church, church, oh God. But we like to be the temple of Lord Jesus Christ. We like to fellowship with you. We like to come in this place and to listen from you. To talk back to you, oh God, as we're doing right now. We thank you, oh God, for touching our heart. Oh God, lead us for the rest of the journey, oh God. And reveal us more, reveal unto us more about this temple. As we're all talking about this, come and dwell in your temple again. Bless be your name forever, oh God. Bless your people that sat here a long time, oh God, listening. Bless if, if one of us, Lord Jesus. We pray also for Sunday service, Lord God. Come and speak to us again. Waiting on you, Lord Jesus. Bless your people as you commit all into your hand. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, prepare me to be a saint. Prepare me to be a saint.
not your friend to God. He's more willing to come back to us than we are willing to go back to him. He's more willing to forgive our sins than we are than we are willing to be forgiven. He's in this he's in this building right now trying to come back to this temple. Just ask for God to sanctify it so he can come back. Let's all pray together as we close in the service. If you have a specific need in your heart, just lift up your hand as we close in the service. Lord Jesus, with a thankful heart, Lord God, we come in before you, Lord God. We are privileged people, Lord God, to sit in this building and to listen to this kind of things. Oh God, to know that we are not created like others. We are not shaped like others out there. But you are created with the purpose. We are shaped with the purpose. And the purpose is for you to come and dwell in our heart and dwell in us. Oh God, give to every one of us that revelation from today to know that I am the temple of God. He shaped me, he, he built me, he created me with that purpose. Here we are, Lord God. It happened that we defile this temple many, many ways and many, many ways, Lord God. But now we're coming before you. This is the, the reason why you shed the blood of Calvary. So that we can come and be purified, be sanctified again, oh God, so that the Almighty God can come and dwell, oh God, in our heart. Lord Jesus, overcome sin through our flesh. Overcome sin through our mind. Overcome this, this world, oh God, through us, Lord Jesus. We believe that, oh God, as we read tonight. Bless your people, Lord Jesus. Come back in our heart, oh God. We don't want to just come in this building to just oh, fellowship with one another, which is good. But we like to be in personal contact with the creator of heaven and earth. Fellowship with him, oh God. That's the reason why you created us. That's the reason why you shed your blood at Calvary. We like to come, oh Lord God. Oh God. Claim that power, claim that blood on us so that we can be pure, clean again to be used by our God. Bless your people, oh God. Bless your servant who use the Lord Jesus and lead us for the rest of our lives. Give us that revelation, oh God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. As we're living from this place, go with us. May your presence go with every one of us and keep us safe until we get home. We bless your name and pray also for Sunday service. Come and pray. Bless us again, oh Lord. We pray and trust and believe, oh God, in Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. 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 You might greet one another. We dismiss in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Till we meet.
Oh, 